For 31 years straight, radio broadcaster Steve Warren set the alarm for 4 a.m. and made his way into a radio studio. His shift, always the morning drive. He made a real name for himself as the popular host of Tigor, three guys on the radio on Team 1200 for the last 19 years. And throughout the years, Steve has been an advocate for raising funds and awareness around autism, something his son Michael was diagnosed with very early on. The father and son duo have teamed up for their blog and their YouTube channel, Adventures in Autism. Now at 52 and with an, or 53 now? Just turned. Oh, thank you. Thank okay, you. happy birthday. I didn't get your card, yeah. but thanks. <laughs> and with an unexpected departure from the show due to some layoffs, Steve has launched his own daily podcast called The Steve Warren Project. Life has its ups and downs, challenges, and heartbreaks, sometimes in the most cruel of ways, and yet the quote Steve comes back to don't let anyone steal your joy, even when you've been dealt an unexpected hand. So welcome to Living Your Life with Leanne Lang, the podcast brought to you by Extension Marketing. And of course, for more information, you can always head to extensionmarketing.com. Hi. Hi. So happy belated birthday. Thank you very much. I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, I've been meaning to catch up with you anyway, so I may slip into interviewer mode because I'm interested in all of this because like you, I've become kind of an entrepreneur on the side um, and... Uh, well, not on the side, on this daily <laughs> podcast thing. It's been, it's been something, but it's been a lot of fun. It's, it's been really neat to be kind of uh, the creator of your own baby. Do you find, though, that you are – this is something that, that I definitely have found. Like, you can't shut off your brain. Like, I was – before, I was physically exhausted just based on the hours and the work and what that entailed. But now I'm mentally exhausted because I'm constantly thinking, what did I do? What didn't I do? Who do I have to email? What did – you know, like, because you're now onto that entrepreneurial side also. Oh, it's it's unbelievable. Like, I I didn't realize when I was doing a daily show how much was done for me. And everything that I do, you know, everybody's been through that where you go down the rabbit hole, you jump online, you have your coffee in the morning. Oh, I think I'll jump on TSN and see how the Sens did last night or whatever, your favorite team. And, you know, a couple of things distract you and you kind of go down this rabbit hole and all that. But everything is a rabbit hole for me right now. So I'll jump on my email and I'll see, uh, oh, there's an email from a sponsor. There's an email from one of my Patreon members on the show. Um, it feels like everything I do distracts me to something else and there's always a to-do list that's just billowing on a daily basis so it, it's been a fascinating ride so far but yeah it's it's been everything you just talked about yeah and learning things that you just didn't think you'd have to learn and realizing how weak you are at certain things like i remember someone saying well send me a google invite I'm like, a what? <laughs> For what? Like on my calendar and my phone, I just know how to do emails, right? Yeah. Like, and it was t the things that take the longest to learn how to do. I just felt like, what a waste of time. Like, I wish it, someone could do this for me. It's every element uh, in terms of doing a podcast on a daily basis. You're the owner. Uh, it's it's like it's internet radio. So it's, a, it's its own little radio station. You're the owner. You're the general manager. You're the sales guy. You do traffic. You do uh, in terms of advertising and scheduling ads. It's, you're the copywriter. You're, you're doing every element of it. And all I did before when I did the TSN 1200 morning show for 19 years, I would get up have a coffee, go to work, turn on a mic. Ta-da! So I really would like to go back and be more appreciative across the board of everybody that I ever worked with who did all those mm -hmm. things that was their job that, uh, that I took for granted. And I had no idea what they did. I just say good morning to them all the time. But it's like, oh, yeah, you had a busy day or you had a job that sucked. You know, all of those things. So uh, it's, been, uh, it's been interesting. It's interesting when you look back, right? And the thing is, is that this was an unexpected, this was an unexpected departure and it, and it shook a lot of people. Uh, and I know I've been out of the building. I've been out of 87 George for, uh, you know, a year and a bit now, but. How are you I, doing? It, it, see, I'm, I'm turning interviewer again. How are you doing with all this? Can you tell that you've got two broadcasters <laughs> in the studio right now? It's I'm like your voice. I care. Like, oh my gosh, like it's, it's been a, a crazy adjustment for me. And I was coming at it from a point where I was mentally prepared like I had had months of of figuring out you know prior to my departure what where I was going or what I thought I wanted to do and uh, given myself months to really accept leaving the public that aspect of the public behind me and the ego uh, and being that girl on TV like I had this I had had months of trying to come up with this decision as to whether or not this was something I wanted to do so I was mentally prepared for that last show that I did 
to, to take it all in and to be like, this was an amazing 20 year career, but I was ready for something else. I look at the situation that you were in uh, and that, you know, it was just a devastating blow of someone that was just such a, you know, like a, a patriarch, I want to say, in the building also. And the psychological, like what that first initial kind of kind of feeling was when you see this 31 years of kind of the same thing every day just being taken from you. It's a double-edged sword because I like the job a lot. I mean, guys would come up to me all the time and say, you have my dream job. And I would always say, well, it's a dream job if you could remove the lack of sleep and if you could add two or three glasses of beer every show, then you've got the dream job. Because I got to, I got to do a job where I went in and 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 I was I'm really good friends with Jr. and and Matt Hamer, uh, and the three of us would just talk sports, which is kind of what I do in my personal life anyway. We go to a pub and watch Stanley Cup final, and so that was the dream job. There's no question about it. And it was a shock for sure to get that news. Everybody's shocked when they're laid off. Um, the boss had emailed me the night before, which was a rarity to say come into my office tomorrow morning. So I had kind of an inkling at that stage. But uh, sure, you, you get you get disappointed by the news, but at the same time, um, it almost felt like it was, and I didn't think of it at the time, but as time marches on, it, it feels like it was maybe time to transition. Uh, the way I kind of think of it in my head is that for a long time, like I'm on this paved road, I'm being pulled by this workhorse, and I've got my feet up, and I'm smoking a cigar, and there's one road. and whistling a tune and everything's fine right now it feels like the horse is just unhooked and i've got no shortage of options now i've got many paved roads in front of me the conundrum now is what road am i on exactly you know right now i'm doing this daily podcast it's been two and a half months since this transition occurred uh am i on the right road i have no idea mm -hmm. i think that i'm making the right decisions but there's something exhilarating about that, too, as opposed to being the guy that's got it all laid out for him. And so I hope I'm on the right road. And um, but I have a lot of questions always in my head. To your point earlier, I'm constantly distracted by things that I need to do, but also thoughts of am I on the yeah. proper route? I think the best way I described it is I was planting a lot of seeds and I'm trying to figure out which ones are going to grow and which ones are weeds <laughs> and which ones need, you know, watering and sunshine and, and love and tenderness and caring for it and which ones I just got to let die, right? You have all of these options. And for me, I, I looked at it that way. I'm planting all of these seeds, see what actually ends up working. And you talk about the fact that people had said this is this dream job and, you know, this is where you landed. Were you always the sports guy growing up? Like, was sports part of your everyday? Like, were you a kid that came home and looked at stats and went through, you know, baseball cards and hockey cards and knew what trades were coming or paid attention at, at deadlines and trade deadlines, even as a young kid? So there's a lot of questions there. And if you picture there's a box beside each question, check them all. all yes. Of them. All of those things you just said. I was a hockey card geek. Um, when the Stanley Cup playoffs rolled around, for example, I would make up the full tournament bracket and I'd have little, you know, as opposed to now where you can easily access via the internet, the little logos for each hockey team, I would take my hockey cards and I would clip the logo out of each hockey card where you know, the team logo so I could put it on my big hockey chart for the playoffs. The bad news about that was several very valuable I mean, hockey cards now have destroyed. a big hole in them, destroyed completely. You know, like the, I had a Gretzky rookie card. I took the Euler logo <gasps> off of it. I had two others, which was good news. But uh, one of them was like, and I think they're going for like three grand now or something like, crazy. So I was very disappointed to see the hole there. But yeah, I mean, I was, I played all the sports. Uh, I was just okay at everything. Um and yeah, that I definitely you, come by it honestly. Were you okay at just being okay with everything? That you you were a fan of the sport, you loved playing sports, but there wasn't this athletic ability to be one of these athletes. Uh, no, I wanted to be a star at everything and make tens of millions of dollars in each sport. And uh, I lashed out at the world, quite frankly, that I couldn't be good at everything. No, I, I mean, like, like any, every other kid, I would love to have been an NHL player, but uh, I just wasn't good enough. I played it like crazy, and that's how it goes sometimes. Uh, that's the thing you're not told when you're talking about living the NHL dream when you're a kid, um, is that uh, you can you can do the whole 
you know, 10,000 hours, they can become an expert in something. It doesn't make, mean you're any good still. You know, there's just some people who are, who are blessed with that talent, and then they have to do the 10,000 hours. Um, anyway. You did, you did the 10,000 hours. You just weren't that good. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I'm st- I, I mean, I, I probably, I mean, I still play two, three times a week, and I'm still not very good. <laughs> are you still, so you're still, that maintained itself. You were active. You still played the games growing up. Oh, yeah. I mean, through adulthood. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I, I play golf like crazy still. I play hockey like crazy still. Uh, I've given up playing softball, which was uh, just standing around for three hours and, you know, an excuse to drink beer. But uh, no, I, I mean, I just, I, to your question of, you know, am I naturally a sports mm-hmm. fan? Absolutely. That's been what I've done. You know, I played probably in about 15 Ottawa Valley hockey leagues over the years because I bounced around in radio a little bit around this area in Renfrew and Smith Falls and Perth, um, all kinds of industrial and, and different hockey leagues around there. And so it's been great. I, I, but uh, yeah, absolutely. A, naturally a sports fan. And um, I absolutely was blessed and fortunate to have fallen into the career that I have. Did you like the discussion, the dialogue around opinions, uh, thoughts, what you thought would be the right decision for a coach or a general manager, or what you thought players or a team or a locker room was going through, or did you actually enjoy being in the moment, like being in the room with the guys, asking the, the questions? Because you could be doing a radio show from one end, or you can be in that locker room with the players on another. Yeah, I, I think I like uh, just the reacting to things. It was uh, the, the thing that came most naturally. It was the, certainly the easiest thing. You know, it wasn't like we were creating anything. We were just spouting off on what we thought about things, trying to be as insightful as we could, uh, try and get into the heads of our listeners who are big fans. Otherwise, they wouldn't listen to sports talk radio. So I really enjoyed that component of it, just having a chance to, you know, talk about the action. I guess if there's one thing that I, I didn't like was that it always had to be the mo- you know, try and be as controversial as possible. Take the most hysterical stance and get everybody riled up, you know. Um, that was never like a mandate or anybody said you needed to do that. But, it, you know, part of it is social media. You want to get people engaging with you, calling the show, emailing, texting, all that. So if you come on and say things like, and say them reasonably with perspective, uh, it's hard to say. Or uh, I'm not sure. How could I possibly know the answer to that? Well, no, that's not going to drive listenership. You have to get on there and give a strong opinion. Uh, it's totally speculation, but you have to give a strong opinion ab- about what you think is occurring. And um, and if there's a little controversy in there as well, then all the better. Okay. I'm sorry, because you just mentioned you're waiting for people to social media in, right? They want to text and to tweet and to respond to you. It That wasn't the game 31 years ago. No. You weren't engaging 31 years ago in creating controversy and in wanting feedback and trying to create this dialogue on Twitter so that you're trending, you know, like there was such a shift in what the job was when you started to, as you're mentioning, what the job was towards the end of. Well, yeah, I mean, I, when I started and I'm aging myself here now is that uh, we had we didn't have any audio editing software. Right, we didn't have internet access. You didn't have internet to give you the well, nice I know, but rundown. Absolutely, but even audio editing software came like probably even before. Well, probably around the same time as the internet. I started out with reel-to-reel tape and actually crudely taking a razor blade, cutting. Well, first I'd make a grease pencil mark as to where I wanted to make an edit, and then I'd actually have to take a razor blade and cut it, and then put again crudely put this scotch tape over top of the edit. And then that was it. And can you imagine if I tried to put together the show I do now, a daily podcast with a guy who's out in Edmonton, by the way, who's co-hosting with me. um, If I tried to edit that show with the old system, that would take me probably five, six weeks to get all that done. The amount of edits that I have to do versus now it's like, and you're off to the races. I'm banging the mic. Sorry about that. Um, But when I started, yeah. In terms of liaisoning with the list, is liaisoning a word? Liaison, uh, we can create a word. I know I mean, we can liaison with someone. I don't know if I could fire an ing on that so liberally. Uh, anyway, in terms, <laughs> in terms of dealing with the listener, it's um, obviously wildly different. You know, any communication would come through the phone and, and not much else. There certainly weren't any emails. 
Um, I might get a letter once in a while, a handwritten letter saying they like the show. Oh, I love that when I was up in Renfrew back in the day. So, yeah, it, it's fully different. And, um, again, only I would only take phone calls. And that would be amazing when you get phone calls because that's asking people to take a, a big chunk out of their day. And that's and, been it. And dial an actual number <laughs> on a rotary phone. I think we had a few that had the buttons going still. It didn't necessarily have to be rotary. But, um, yeah, I mean, they they – when they engaged, it was great, and uh, it was it's amazing the evolution of sports talk radio in the meantime, and that you don't hear many calls anymore. Post game shows, for example, but in terms of day to day shows, it's it's the Twitter, it's the it's using the hashtag, it's creating a dialogue and creating a conversation that you can see a chain of where the discussion is going, and people feel I think a bit more that they're a part of it or that yeah. they're they're com- they're in on the conversation, and people don't want to actually phone their spouses and their family no, and their it. friends, right? They want to just text it yeah. out, right? That's just easier. I don't know why that is, but that's the way things are at right now. People couldn't be bothered to pick up a phone and actually have a discussion. And so that would certainly, if that applies, then it certainly applies to sports talk radio. How are you on the phone? Do you still like conversations? No, God, no. See, so you're as guilty well, as Well, we, in setting this up, did we have one phone conversation? No, we didn't. No, we didn't. See, you're the same as me. <laughs> but, I, but I actually, but I, you're with certain things I am and with certain things I'm not. I still, still talk to some girlfriends on the phone. The like only way still, I still, like, and I still call home. Like I, like it, with Tony and I, like we still have full on conversations a couple times during the day, checking in where are you at. That's Who's adorable. The love is still there. That's nice. Isn't that cool? It's very nice. Um, I think if I have, <laughs> He's like, uh, what do you want? <laughs> if I have a choice, mm-hmm. I'll always go text. I think the only time that I'll make phone calls my first choice as if it's a sensitive discussion mm-hmm. which, which I'd rather not have recorded for all time uh, that someone can say hey you said this or whatever if, you know those occasionally come along favorite interview my favorite yeah. interview wow um I would have to go back to the Wayne Gretzky interview that we did in 2002 it was just to set it up Canada hadn't won a gold medal in hockey if you can believe it in 50 years at the Olympics and uh, Wayne Gretzky was the GM of the team that year and in 02 at Salt Lake City they finally broke that drought and we were made to work that was a Sunday afternoon it was a great show we had a great time with it we talked to Gord Downey who was in Salt Lake City big hockey fan lead singer of the Tragically Hip and he phoned in we were talking to people all across Ottawa who were having these big hockey parties getting drunk Um, So it was a really fun afternoon of broadcasting, and it was all capped off by, at the end, they win the gold. But we see while we're watching on TV like everybody else while we're broadcasting, and we're not supposed to actually give stuff away. It was kind of illegal uh, against the broadcast rights for us to be doing play-by-play while we're doing radio. We're watching it, and we're supposed to leave that to the CBC, and we're going, oh, and we're just screaming every time a goal is scored. And so at the end of it, we're pumped, we're freaking out, and we see Wayne Gretzky, he's on the bench at this stage, the celebration on the ice has just begun. And we see he's on his cell phone, and we're like, why? why? Who would he be talking to? At the, he must be calling his dad, he must be on this phone with the prime minister. <laughs> and turns out, our producer's like, on the other side, so just like over here, like, screaming at us from behind the glass, like, and we're, what is he doing over there? Well, it's Wayne Gretzky on the phone to talk to us, to react to the moment because Jim Jerome is really good friends with mm-hmm. Wayne Gretzky and now he's my co-host on the podcast once again after all these years. But I guess they'd set it up after that maybe you can give me a call at some point after the game. Well, Jimmy thought, okay, maybe hours later, you know, after all the celebration had died down, but no, right in the middle of the hoopla and you could hear players, Canadian players on the ice celebrating while we had this conversation with Wayne Gretzky. Uh, trouble was we couldn't get for some reason he was having trouble dialing back in because we needed to get him through the soundboard so we had to call us back to get through the soundboard and at that stage of the game things started screwing up and we're like no we're missing the interview of our lives and uh, we finally got him on the first thing he says geez guys I just talked to the prime minister and I couldn't get a hold of you guys (laughs) I couldn't get through to you and it ended up being a great interview and really memorable that's a really neat story it's interesting when you also have a personal connection, I think sometimes, and being able to share in the joy of when things are actually happening, right? And I know Jim was close friends with Wayne, right? So you have this ability to, to experience it a little bit different than other people 
when you when you kind of sometimes know the behind the scenes or you, you kind of been through experience on the off, the off the record conversations you have with buddies sometimes. Yeah, um, I mean, and and it, it was funny because uh, just last night. Uh, we got into a conversation about Wayne Gretzky and uh, to have that access and uh, that kind of behind the scenes thing. It's, you know, I've had, a, I've talked to Wayne Gretzky probably about 10 times in an official capacity like mm -hmm. this. But um, some of the more fun things are just when I'm having these sort of secondhand conversations with Jimmy as the conduit. So Wayne Gretzky was before the game for the Stanley Cup final, uh, he was one of the analysts at the start. And uh, I thought he did a really great, great job. And I talked about that on the podcast that he's 58 years old now, Wayne Gretzky. And I found it interesting that, you know, this late stage is like, he's really articulate and he's a really interesting analyst. And uh, I said that to Jimmy and Jimmy immediately just texts nice. Gretzky. He texts Gretzky, my buddy in Ottawa said, blah, 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 blah. And he wrote back this really uh, kind thank you. And... Uh, just that, just as an example, and I've had several conversations with Gretzky, with Jimmy as our conduit. Um, you know, we we talked about hockey trivia and things like that. So yeah, there's a lot of just a lot of behind the scenes stuff every once in a while with uh, some of these celebs. That that that's a cool part that um, that I really enjoy. We you, ha you have, and, and I, especially I too, because I did sports for ten years. But there's been a lot of change. You've had baseball teams come and go, soccer teams come and go, football teams come and go, lacrosse. Uh, there has been a drastic wave of sports coming in and out of the city. Is it exciting for you when you see something new come? Are you excited for the players, for the fans, uh, for shows to be able to talk about it? You know, I think the biggest thing probably too has been the Red Blacks and and that rebirth of an amazing franchise who, who has done incredibly well. This podcast is brought to you by Extension Marketing. They are a new breed of marketing agency that acts as your virtual marketing department, designing and implementing cost-effective marketing strategies that will grow your business. I can speak to this personally as I've been using the Extension Marketing team to help me launch and grow my business. Founder Pat Whalen has been a lifesaver for me, a genuine coach guiding me along the way into uncharted territory. Tell them you're a friend of the show and receive a free one-hour consultation. Check them out at extensionmarketing.com. Well, and the thing about them is that, it, that it, they used to be such a dumpster fire. I mean, the Ottawa CFL, the Red Blacks have never been that. But just as someone who covered, I guess it was my the Rough Riders I would have been covering even as early as the late 80s, um, they were terrible for the better part of 10 years. And to see what they've evolved into, uh, first uh, the Rough Riders died, Renegades come around. They too were a dumpster fire and they died. And then the Red Blacks come in, they make all the renovations to the stadium and they've turned it into a, a real experience. And it's funny how th when things become fashionable, um, everybody is pumped about it. Uh, the game itself, you know, they, they're more competitive, but it's still CFL football. Um, and every, it just fell out of favor. The building wasn't great. Um, and now that it's a, a place to be, a place to be seen, uh, it's changed everything. Um, and it, it's just such a contrast to where things were with the Rough Riders back in the day. Just such terrible football. Uh, just a pack of clowns running that thing. Ownership after ownership that was just terrible. And... I'm just really happy for football fans in Ottawa because on Sports Talk Radio, throughout all the lean years, I would always be yelling, put a decent owner in there, put a decent product on the field, and watch the Ottawa football fan go. Give them a chance. Mm -hmm. Give them something that they can be proud of and root for, and they'll be there. And sure enough, they did, and the fans are. Like our field of dreams, right? If you build it. They will come. Yeah, and, and while you have the field of dreams, they've got that too. Uh, you know, don't put on um, a situation where your general manager is literally drafting dead people. That actually happened one time. The general manager of the Ottawa Rough Riders did such little homework uh, when he, he signed a dead guy. Are you serious? I'm deadly serious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the deadly. I, who was this? Garney Henley was the guy's name. Wow, see? He, he's a, he was a CFL Hall of Famer, one of the greatest players to ever play in the CFL yeah. with the Hamilton Tiger Cats back in the 60s and 70s. And uh, he would later become the general manager of the Rough Riders. And he and his scouting team thought that uh, this man who was six feet under might be able to help them this wow. year. 
See the little things you learn. Yeah. The little things you learn. I like that. D- did you like the little tidbits of information that you would figure out from stats or from people or when you would interview a player that they would divulge something that was personal or different? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to your personal life in just a little <laughs> bit. So, so don't you worry about that. I, I love that part. I, I, I mean, because nothing's more boring to me. Uh, with respect to the colleagues, my colleagues who have to do it, than hearing you know player interviews between oh periods. Oh my god! Just you know, it's always the same stuff. It's just it's having access, and as a viewer, you like to see you know the human side of the you know that you see them out there skating around, smashing into things, scoring goals. Uh, you like to see you hear the guy talk, but he might as well be reading from the phone book because uh, everything is so rote, and he's just not giving you anything. So I like this, the one-to-one sit-down where we can go through that stuff, take it one game at a time, good Lord willing. Oh, my uh, God, we'll play the full 60 minutes, really a team effort. Exactly. So you dealt with that for about a decade. Um, but, the, I mean, for example, I, I've just uh, done a couple of interviews. I'm, I'm writing a bit for Faces Magazine as well, doing their Sens features. So I've had a chance to sit down in the last month with Thomas Shabbat and with the new Sens head coach, DJ Smith. And so we did all that hockey stuff, blah, 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 yeah. blah. And then at the end, you start lawballing, and you do this too, uh, you know, the get-to-know-you questions. And those are the ones that are great because not though, they're interesting. It's just stuff that you're not telling everybody all the time. You know, Thomas Shabbat's got a dog named Milo. You know, do you need to know that? I'd rather hear that than take it one game at a time. And so I found out a little bit about his background and his you know, growing up in a, a little village outside Laval that you know had no girls in it. And so he just played hockey with the boys all the time and just you know playing in hockey in the basement with his older brother and his dad. I mean, those are storylines I would rather hear. You know, they're not going to be made into movies, but they are way more interesting than the standard rote oh, hockey answers. Drove me nuts. Really drove me nuts. Uh, and I, you know what? I had uh, Pierre Dorian in here uh, not long ago. And I thought... How is Pierre? He was really interesting. And I, you know what? I appreciated his honesty. You know, like where, you know, where he went or the emotions he had when getting a job, right? Or like he went to the cemetery. To talk, like, he, like there was interesting things that you learn about people. And that for me is the, the, my favorite part about podcasting is that you have the time to get to know somebody or to ask them the questions that are much more meaningful than we would have in a three to four minute interview that you had, you had time constraints and you had to get to get commercial. Get to commercial. Break. Yeah. Oh my God. Pay get the to, bills. Get, wrap it up. Wrap it up. Exactly. We get got another feature going. Yeah. That was, uh, that was my most dreaded. Just get to commercial. But Pierre Dorian, just to interject, uh, he is uh, an interesting story in that, um, and that's something, he's a symbol of one of the things that drives me crazy about the media in that, People will bury a guy for some of the things he says. But at the same time, we're sitting here talking about how boring the interviews are and, and how robotic so, some of the interviews are in the, in, the, in the sports realm. Pierre Dorian is an extremely giving interview. Mm-hmm. He, will, he will talk himself into... <laughs> He'll talk himself into trouble. <laughs> exactly right. And so, but that, that, he's doing that in the name of being kind and gracious and, and being a good person. And so... Then we take this, we walk away with this 40 minute interview and we find this little snippet where, and maybe some, maybe there's a language barrier too, because his first language is not English, even though he's better at English than I am. Um, It's the guy gets buried because he says something wrong in this one little snippet. Well, what do you want? Do you want gracious and, and giving in an interview? Or do you want the standard robotic stuff that's good for business that's all spin doctoring? You know, and so... Pierre Dorian would be a good sort of symbolic character to discuss some of the things I dislike about the the media the game and the interviews and things. And then and then you appreciate when people actually give out themselves. One hundred percent. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of start there because I've known you for a long time. I mean, twenty years in the building, and. Y- we all have our lives, and we're all. I still in remember, and out. by the way, the day that Ken Avera was showing you around. You had just I think that was your first day on the job and I think it was Ken Avera that was ushering you around the building. That would have likely been it. Yeah, that yes. was the day. I don't know why that's pertinent. I interrupted well, you Ken, for no good no, reason. No, no, well, Ken, Ken Avera <laughs> was the one who found me. I Where was, were you hiding? I was. I had just finished <laughs> university. Yeah, I mean, my way into the business was, was really quite fascinating. 
But I know that we, and it's interesting because there was a time in that building, when I'm talking about the Media Mall, the 87 George Street, when there was like, it was a bustling place. There was like TV stations coming, like, and there were shows, there was morning shows and afternoon shows and evening shows and late night shows and all these different radio shows going on the building. And there were cafeterias because there were so many of us in there that we needed to be fed, you know? That building has gone through thousands of people. But in saying that, we all were kind of just walking our way through that building and not really getting to know if you were in television, who was up in radio or what their lives were like or what was happening. And it was really the introduction to you of understanding that you were always hosting this golf event uh, for autism that you start to go, why is Steve so passionate about autism? Like, what's the connection right there? And do you mind? I want to go into the fact that we live these very public lives and we talk about things and we're always people get to know us just based on they think they know us also because they see us or they hear us what it was like and what it is like to to raise a son and to be as active as you are in the community as busy as you are with work and still have a lot of work to do when you're at home well, that's a big question. What's it like? Uh, oh, trust me, because we got time to go into all of these answers, <laughs> Steve. And I and I think a lot of families, a lot of people will will appreciate the kind of the mindset that you come at it from. It gives you perspective uh, if you want to talk about mindset. Um, you know, I coached minor hockey for a long time, and I would listen to the problems that parents were dealing with with their neurotypical kids. Uh, who are you know physically gifted some of them because it was really high level competitive hockey and some of the things that would bother them as parents and I'm like wow that that's that's your obstacle that's your challenge as a parent um, so the perspective that um, parenting a child with a disability brings um, I, I don't think um, many can understand unless you're going through it right uh, you know you, you I don't even know how far back you want to go on this. Uh, let's go back wanna... because let's go. You met Linda. Uh, she was also in broadcasting. Yep. I knew Linda as a radio host, right? Like, so where did you guys, where did you guys meet? How old were you when you met? Uh, I was 21 and she was 19. I was the obnoxious uh, established radio broadcaster at 21. At 21. Thinking I was all that. And she was uh, an intern coming down from Canador College in North Bay, and she had lived uh, not far from Renfrew, uh, halfway between Vinton and Fort Collunge. And uh, she thought this was a sensible place to do her internship. And uh, that she was, she had a boyfriend at the time too, and so uh, that's unfortunate for him. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we met uh, in Renfrew doing radio there, and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. You were you were quite young when you met. Oh yeah, you were quite you were quite young. Very young, yeah. I mean, we'd, uh, and it was. I think about it all the time about how your life. I mean, talking about forks in the road, um, I was working in Smith Falls um, while I went to college, and a friend of mine who worked there. It was his last day, and uh, he, he told me he was going to this little station in Renfrew for a full time job, and he was walking out the door, and I was uh, getting some water or something, and. and and it just dawned on me. I turned around at the last second. And he's halfway out the door. And I said, hey, can you let the guy know if, if they need anybody else that I might be interested? And he said, yeah, sure. Wait, you know what? They are. And he could have walked out the door and I'd never see him again and never think of him again. But instead, I, I thought to ask that one question as he left. And next day, I called up. And within 24 hours, I was the new midday announcer at a radio station in Renfrew, if he walks out that door and, and he was seconds away from doing that, I don't go, I don't think about it again. I don't get the job in Renfrew. I don't meet my wife, Linda. I don't have the family I have. And so I find that all fascinating how life can turn on a dime like that. It can. A quick spin around at the water fountain. Absolutely. That's really neat. Yeah. So, um, so you're 21. She's 19. Yeah. It's love at the office. Do you keep it? Do you keep it low key that you guys are? I mean, oh no, 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 no! It no, was no. full on. It was you like know. crazy. It was like people would say, "Go get a room, you two. It's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, we we uh, we got on great, and uh, it was some of my most exciting times in radio, right? Because we're all new and fresh and excited about the industry. So, oh my God, I get to go somewhere and turn on the microphone and talk to people on the radio, and we were all pretty pumped about that because it was all a young group, and we're all making uh, like three thousand dollars a year. It was ridiculous, uh, a little more than that, but it was not much. And 
It didn't matter. No, because you felt like you were living the life. Absolutely. And we didn't have responsibilities. We just paid for our apartments and go to work and go to all these uh, radio events. And we had a blast. It was great. And, uh, and, and again, we were all about the same age. So we got to go out and, uh, it was a fabulous time and and I, and it feels like yesterday and and I miss those days for sure uh, particularly with all the responsibility I have these days um I would never in a million years when I think about that guy and the, and the guy I am now with all the things I've got going on that I I would not think that that was my path at all It was an interesting path and it took you on a couple of turns so you're 19 and 21 when you meet how old are you when you get married um, I was a slow, slow kind of a... So it was like this hot, heavy, really quick love at first sight relationship. But how how long did you take? I was about six years. Wow. Six, okay. seven years. Well, so you I'm matured. Sure. You grew up. I don't, I don't know if that's standard these days or not. But at the mm-hmm. time, it felt like I was yeah. I was getting the ear dragging your heels thing. It's, you know, you kind of have to, you know, get on with things yeah. or, or, or move on. And, uh, and I absolutely made the right decision there i've made some interesting decisions over the years the number one decision though was marrying linda well that's a really nice thing to say thank you yeah i hope she hears it wow are you gonna play her the podcast <laughs> can you mark where this is on the tape in terms of the time and i'll take her right to that spot there you go that'll work okay so children you, you both wanted it was mm-hmm. on the on, in the cards like yeah oh yeah um we definitely both wanted children it becomes an interesting discussion because um, autism has a genetic component to it. They say, they say, I don't know. So when you have a child with autism, um, it's the work of three kids. And so at that stage, do we want a fourth kid? Fourth kid. Michael was first. Michael was first. Yeah. And uh, so all the things that went on with, uh, with autism, uh, they're four years apart. My daughter, Lindsay and my son, Michael, and how, yeah, there was some how discussion. How old are they now? Uh, they are 23 and 20. 23 and 20. Michael will be 24 soon. Okay. Actually, no, she, uh, Lynn, well, she's about to turn 20. Okay. So. When did you realize with Michael that as a new parent, things weren't progressing or, or things weren't quite as you had expected? Uh, he would have Milestones. been, her, it was, it was Linda's mom because she had seven kids of her own. So she knew all the little milestones for development. And so he's, he's a year old and he's not really responding very well. So she articulated that like, you know, I don't know, maybe it's a deafness thing. We don't, cause he wasn't responding to his name and he had before. And so she noticed it. And then we started noticing it too. Um, and he seemed to be doing fine. But then like he started the growth patterns were yeah, fine. As far as I knew, I mean, a first time parent, right? Everything seems okay. And there was, there was interaction, but the interaction just sort of faded and whatever little words that he had going faded. And so everything sort of crumpled up into one word and it wasn't even a word. Uh, it was Kana. That was his all purpose word for everything. And I didn't know what that was for a long time. Kana. But it was the start of the sentence, can I have this or that? He was asking for things, can I, can I, can I? And that was all he had, even though he had more words than that. He started waving backward. He used to wave fine, but then just started waving backward. He started fixating on the hologram on my credit card, which I thought at the time meant he was going to be a big shopper <laughs> and or he was looking to do some things online. I don't know. But uh, he was just fascinated, I guess, with the lights that the little hologram would cast. So those were the first signs of it. And we had him tested for um, hearing issues. Uh, Turned out he was fine because they put you in this chamber and they have these little sounds everywhere. And uh, they were able to say, no, his hearing is excellent. But the audiologist was the first to say, I think you might want to consider getting him tested for autism. And uh, that was, woo, floor comes out from underneath you. There's just the possibility of that. That hadn't even dawned on us until we went to the audiologist and a million emotions after that. And a million emotions after that, and it's still the unknown. Oh, yeah. So when you have the audio- audiologist say to you, you might want to consider this, was there the floor being ripped from you at that point? Was it just the what if, the circumstance, or was it an immediate, we need to get this figured out? 
quickly. Yeah, we were very proactive because some people wait for years and years to get a diagnosis, but we got on the horse. You have to file out this long application form. You know, what's going on with Michael right now that has you wanting to, you know, apply for this diagnosis. But everywhere that there was empty space on the sheet, we would write in, if there's a cancellation, call this number. We'll be there in 10 minutes. Um, and maybe it worked, I don't know, but we did, did seem to get a, a diagnosis a lot earlier than most people. Um, you know, the immediate thought when the audiologist said that was, well, maybe it's not. Um, hopeful that it's not. And then we go through this process. We finally get to CHEO. We get, finally sit down. They go through this. And, and it's not like a diagnosis, like um, in a medical sense. It's a psychologist and a child in a room very much like this. And they watch them play and try and engage with them and see what they can or can't do. And if they check off, you know, uh, if there's 12 elements of autism, if they check off seven or eight, boom, there's your diagnosis. There's several other diagnoses as well, like uh, per, uh, PDD, NOS, uh, pervasive development disorder, not otherwise specified. Um, there's Asperger's. So there's various diagnoses that you can get. Autism is probably the one you want, though, because it tends to open up more doors in terms of funding. So we get that information. Um, the, the psychologist and the child and Michael, uh, they do what they do, and then they usher Linda and I into a meeting with the head psychologist at CHEO. I'm not sure if you're still there, Dr. Jennifer Dungeyer. She's absolutely wonderful and sympathetic, and she broke the news to us that our child, uh, and he's just over two years old at that point, uh, was autistic. And, uh, and as the words came out of her mouth, I was like having out-of-body experiences, like, what? Um, I can't even, in this setting, begin to articulate how many emotions I had going on there. It was a tough day for sure. For Linda, too. I mean, oh, God, yeah. And you, did you deal with it similar? No. No, I was, um, and this is part of why I started the Microsoft Golf, Golf Classic for Autism, because I felt like uh, I wanted to fight something. I, want, I was more, uh, it's, it's the fight or flight response, right? I think I was more fight and Linda was more flight. And uh, for a while there, she was devastated, like, oh, my God, and a lot of dark thoughts for both of us. But I was more in the mode of fix it. You know, it's broken as fix it. And the only thing I think could think to do, because I don't know anything about autism, is r raise money. You know, and so I did this this golf tournament for 11 years as the chairman of it. And it ran its course. We raised a lot of money for Ottawa Autism Charities. And that was my outlet. Um, but Linda quickly picked herself up. And she became the rock. Um, I was just over here punching at the air. And she then turned this whole thing into a productive course, getting him to the right people. Because there's a, at the time, you know, we were kind of on the leading edge of this swell of autism. And there weren't that many options for us. There weren't that many therapists out there. Uh, and it was expensive. So funding, you know, and I was in my early days of radio and not making any money at all. So it was cost prohibitive so we managed as we could and, and linda was the quarterback of all that and she was an absolute rock star it's interesting in the dialogue that parents have now because there's there's the levels we're on the autism spectrum you know that word spectrum has come in and so you have this varying degrees of autism and what the child is capable and not, and not capable of doing where so people have an understanding right now where where would michael fall on that i would say middle of the road we're blessed with the fact that he's verbal because a lot of the kids just aren't they can't articulate anything and so they have to do it through um sign language through um they have uh PECS, I think they call it picture exchange system or something like that, uh, where they basically, if they want a coffee, they'll hand you a picture of a coffee. They've got this big album of things they commonly want, and that's how they communicate. Uh, so Michael's middle of the road. Um, he's superhuman as far as memory goes. Like he can tell you the name of every pop song uh, from the last 20 years, like, and, and the day it came out. So if I, the song on the radio, Whatever it is, he listens to a serious program called Pop 2K, so all the pop songs of the 2000s, and he literally knows the name of the artist, the name of the song, and the day it came out, like day and year. So he's got 
for the things he's passionate about, I feel like if I can find, if I can channel it into something that's productive, like he could, he could do something really special in this world. The challenge is, is that the things that he's so passionate about are so utterly, utterly useless. <laughs> do you need, Leanne, if, if you do, do you need all the Disney movies written out, the credits, the movie credits at the end, do you need them written out by acronym perfectly at any point today? Because if you do... You've got the guy. I've got the guy, you know? If you need someone to do all these pop songs for you, um, he, he's just superhuman when it comes to memory and the things he's passionate about but oh boy it's about finding something productive for him to do in this world is it the focus because i i've I've watched some of the videos and i want to get to the adventures in autism but you know you could take him to a library and for him to organize books oh yeah you know that's where the attention is able to focus oh yeah he he his deal is is finding order in the chaos If there's chaos, he tries to take care of it. And if he can't take care of it, he'll destroy it. So organization is not just important to him. It's everything to him. Uh, Having symmetry in the world. And so when I say if things aren't working out, getting rid of it, that's his, his strategy. Because if he gets rid of dad's laptop, which has a scratch on the outside, oh, I can't do anything about that. So I'll rip the top part, I'll throw it in the garbage, and dad will buy a new one. And inevitably he does because he needs his laptop. But it's frustrating in that he's he's consistently doing things like that. Like, uh, and even when he was little, you know, it it was fashionable for a while there to, and maybe it still is, to have like a hole in your jeans, right? A nice kind of hole, your knees sticking out. So he's in a, a classroom assembly, and he's sitting beside a girl who's got a hole in her jeans. He can't do anything about that. So how does he strategize that? Reaches over and rips the jeans, not off the girl or anything like that, but enough that I'm sure her parents were not very happy with Michael or us. So that's his kind of strategy. And, uh, and that's kind of how he looks at the world. So with the books, if uh, I don't know exactly what his plan is, he might alphabetize them. It might be color coded. It might be based on genre or the characters involved in the books, but he'll have his own little system. We go into Value Village every third day and he goes in and he organizes the books and he organizes all the old VHS tapes because when he was a little kid, it was all VHS at that stage. So he gets a kick out of seeing that's kind of like a little retro for him. And so he's got to organize everything. So yeah, he, uh, he but needs to find... But when you say that, that's, that's the outlet. Every third day, that's the that's the running errands for you. Oh, yeah. The running errands is it's Michael needs that outlet. Today's yeah. Valley Village Day. Yeah, and he's very insistent on things. Like two days ago, I was uh, we had to go to the Coliseum movie theater. I want to look at the movie posters, and we had time to kill. So I said, well, this won't take too long. I assumed we'd just go up to the outside and look at the posters. And we did. So I got to see the ones inside now. So we go inside and I thought that was the extent of it. But no, the ones he was talking about are actually in the theater, well past admission where you got to pay and everything. And I've only got 15 minutes. I'm not going to a movie to go see some movie posters. But he had, he had to see it so badly that he barged past me, barged past the ticket guy and just sprinted as though he was trying to save a loved one to go see these movie posters. That's the level of obsession and passion for the things he needs to see. So... That's the headspace he's in. He's 23. Yep. Will he, when you look at the longevity of the care that Michael will need, what, what discussion, like how do these discussions happen around the dinner table with Linda to say what, how, and what will Michael experience as an, as a, as an adult? Yeah, that's, that's all, uh, uh, one of the many forks in the road we've been talking about, you know, whether it's professional or with Michael, for example, like he's just at a stage now where he's verbal. Um, he, he's able to take care of himself in, in, the, in our four walls, but um, finding what he's going to do for the rest of his life, that's always off the back of my head. It's always, it always, you know, every, every day it pops into my head what what's going to become of Michael after Linda and I are gone because there's all this protesting happening right now at Queens Park everybody's mad at Lisa McLeod 
Premier Ford about the way things are being handled with this new autism funding regime. Everyone is upset about it, uh, particularly the under 18 crowd. We fought all that same battle with the liberals back in, in you know, the late 90s, early 2000s. So I'm, I'm watching history play itself out again. And I, I just look at it and I say, to, uh, okay, well, you don't have it that bad right now, to be honest. I, I don't I don't mean to suggest anything, but, you know, that's a difficult time. But when we were diagnosed in the 90s, we had nothing. You know, now at least there's more therapists out there. Um, now at least the government is aware of things. Um, it feels like it's it's evolved at least a little bit. And so, again, I, I think that came off as me saying, you got nothing to complain about, you folks. But um, I don't mean that at all. But it was the dark ages when we were mm -hmm. diagnosed. And now we're in the dark ages as far as what to do with aut autistic adults. Because there's, there's just nothing there. There's nothing waiting for Michael. There are group homes that exist. And some are good. And some are horrific. Um, so right now, for the immediate future, Michael's with us. Um, and you don't sign up for that. You know, when you, when, you be wanted, when you think to yourself, you have this beautiful baby, you don't sign up for 50 years. You think to yourself, 18 to 22. And this was a video, and I have to be honest, like I, I definitely, the tears swelled up in watching your video. Um, a trip to, is it a trip to Holland? Yeah. Or, so I, I want people to actually go. It's Adventures in Autism, and it was one of the first videos. But you can the website, by the way, is adventuresinautism.ca. You can access all the videos from there. Okay, I, I hope people do go and check them out. But the honesty of which you describe the anticipation of being a parent and how you planned it, right? And you compare it to how we plan this lifetime trip that we're going to Paris or Italy, Italy, Italy. Uh, and you get on the plane and you're so excited that you're going to be landing in Italy and midway through the flight, you find out that you've landed in Holland and that you're never going to get to Italy and Holland is it. How did you come up with the scripting or the writing or the, that thought process in creating a video like that, that I think for any parent who is going to be, is dealing with, or might one day have to deal with a prognosis or a change in what they anticipate or expected to watch this or to feel this? Well, the video creation is mine. I have to give credit to the original writer, a woman named Emily Kinsley, I believe is her name. And that was one that really inspired me in the early days uh, because I wouldn't change, despite everything I've said and, and, and all the things that, you know, are challenges with Michael, um, if you f quote unquote fixed him, um, I, I would be devastated at the loss of the person he is now. And that particular poem, essay, whatever you want to say, um, it really affected me. And I, I said to myself, that's something that I would like more people, a story I'd like more people to hear. And so in video form, I put that together. And I think it really does touch a lot of people and not necessarily just people that are dealing with a child with disabilities. No, I think in any situation, yeah. even the situation that you, you find yourself in as an adult with life and changes and not being where you expected to be. When did you first come across that poem? Like, was it more recently or was it something that you could have used 23 years ago when you got the diagnosis? No, it's, it's been around a while. Uh, it was fairly early on in the game and was extremely helpful to just move yourself into that mental space because what other choice do you have? Really, what, what people say things like, uh, I really admire you uh, for you know, being such an autism advocate. Well, what's my option? You know, what, what, I appreciate the thoughts, don't get me wrong. And I, and I, I always appreciate when people say kind things. But when it's thrust upon you like that, uh, you have really no other option. You love your child unconditionally. People say that all the time. I love my child unconditionally. And uh, this really puts that to the test. And absolutely, you have to fight for your child, whether it's um, the best outcomes, the best funding. Uh, you have to do what you have to do. And, and, and this poem just sort of framed that for me, that... Yeah, it's not the trip I expected, but now that I'm on that trip and I've learned to appreciate it, I don't know if I'd want to, again, using that analogy, I don't know if I want to go to Italy now. How did 
this changed the relationship with Linda uh, in that I, I know for a while she was busy working and then she became this advocate for Michael and, and getting to the doctors and getting to the treatments and doing things like how do how did your relationship shift or change or how did it did it get better in dealing with this and having to partner through this prognosis and know that right this isn't at 22 he's out of the house but this is at 50 <laughs> you're still there yeah it's um i think marriage is always strengthened by having children because it's it's a common denominator it's it's uh, this little person that you both love and i think that that common denominator really strengthens a marriage and when you have a neurotypical child you can articulate your love of your child to anybody like you can you can discuss all the things about your child that you have in common with other parents and oh yeah oh my child uh, made honor roll or my child's on the soccer team and all those things uh so when you have a child with autism it's really you and your spouse and you're your only sounding boards for the most part as time rolled on, we had we found other parents who were dealing with the same, and that's a unique friendship unto itself, where you have other people that know exactly what you're going through. Like uh, Sean Van Allen, for example, he's a former Ottawa senator, and he's in town here still. And when we talk about things, we talk about sports, and we mix a little autism talk in there as well. But our sons, at one point, we had to, uh, you know, actually. What's the word? Anesthetize, anesthetize, whatever it is. Put her, put, put her kids temporarily to sleep, whatever that word is. Uh, we had to uh, do that just to get our t son's teeth cleaned, right? These are the little things that um, people take for granted with their neurotypical kids. So um, to have those friendships, you know, that, that's a good thing. But in the early days, for several years, we cut ourselves off a little bit. And we had some friends drift on us as well. And so in that time, I think that really strengthened our relationship. I think it could go dramatically in one of two directions and thankfully ours went in a good direction in that uh we kind of educated ourselves and empowered ourselves uh, went to all these seminars together and read books and hired people and picked people's brains and did the best we could and i think all that galvanized the marriage uh, i've heard on several occasions that um marriages have completely been obliterated by this in that one of the parties or maybe both absolutely can't handle this hand they've been dealt how did you take care and i'm going to go back to the living your life title of this and health and wellness and lifestyles as as our topics because you mentioned like you're active you play hockey you're playing softball you golf that you needed to find your own time uh to be able to have self-care that you were going to be okay too. I mean, you you need to be around for Michael, right? So how much did you invest or how much did Linda invest also in trying to find time to be able to, to take care of you? Wow. Um, it's been better lately because, uh, you know, he's older now. Um, he doesn't need as much 100% attention. In the early days, he would bolt. He would run into traffic. He would run into waterways. Um, and we weren't sure why half the time um, he wanted to swim. I'm sure that was part of uh, the swimming part, but now we, he's just more stable and now we don't have to worry too much. So if we need some level of respite, like you're going to watch a movie now and just cut off, escape, watch our movie. He's, he's upstairs watching uh, annoying orange, his favorite YouTube channel, annoying orange. Uh, remind me at some point in the next 20 years to find the guy who created annoying orange and, uh, well, I'll leave it at this. I'll, I'll, I'll issue him a strongly worded letter of how upset I am about the existence of that channel. It is annoying. Uh, but he's, he gets... But it allows you to get... 100%. You can watch a movie. Yeah, for sure. So he throws on the headphones, watches that. We watch a movie. So now it is uh, less of an issue than it used to be. Um, it used to be n not much in the way of respite. Um, and now because he's easier to care for, Lynn and I have gotten a chance to actually, you know, not just watch a movie. We've actually uh, been down to Barbados uh, to get away by ourselves and oh my god that was an absolute epiphany to be able to do that how many years was that that you that you were able to go away the two of you 
that we were or weren't. That, like, how long did it take for you to be able to go away? Oh, that? yeah, uh, at least a decade, I would say. It was at least 10, 12 years before we sort of felt comfortable leaving him with someone for that length of time. Um, we stepped away a little because the last few years we bought a house from the 1800s. Yes, you, you bought a, a farmhouse in Manitick. Yes. Is it like 140 years old? What's Exactly. Okay. And um, I didn't feel comfortable leaving my autistic son in this, well, it's new to us, not brand new at all. And I didn't know how this, this house would function in the course of the winter. So for the last few winters, we haven't done that. Um, we might get back to it soon because it seems to be standing. It doesn't seem to be falling over anytime soon. But uh, yeah, I, so we've gotten away from it a little bit lately. But uh, yeah, for the first 10, 12 years, we did not want to take our eye off of Michael because just for his own oh safety. God, just, I just, I'm <clears throat> exhausted at the thought of coming home from the day of getting up at 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning, going, doing these shows and coming home. And it's not like you can just put your feet up. You've got full full time needing to watch over but at least i was able to go for the most part like uh you could be home for some of it i was home but at least i you know work itself in the early days became a respite like okay that it's on linda good luck with all that and off i'd go i think that's how many new moms feel when they go back to work after mat leave you know you can actually go to your desk and have a coffee or read a paper like if i i'll say it you know it was like vacation for a little yeah, while. Absolutely. Yeah. And meanwhile, I felt badly because uh, the way it panned out was like Linda had a really good radio and TV career rolling along. And then, you know, we get this diagnosis and then she tailed back on everything and then in, sort of moved into part time status. And then opportunity after opportunity goes by because she's got to, you know, she can't really commit to that at this stage of the game. And uh, yeah, so she had to sacrifice a ton Uh, to be our autism rock star and and guide this thing. You're trying to guide it a little differently. What was the idea to create Adventures in Autism? And what did you hope, especially bringing Michael in on this, that you hope to share or that hopefully other families will find this and and be able to enjoy it? Well, there's two elements when it comes to the... um the autism cause that I thought about. And as I mentioned, I did the golf tournament for a long time, which was mostly about fundraising. And it felt a little bit like after 11 years, we raised almost half a million dollars for autism. And it felt like um, it was gratifying, but it, you know, autism's still here and it sort of ran its course. And the other part was the awareness angle, which is this, what, what this is kind of designed for. Um, and and I, I think the reason I do it is because all too often, when I'm out with Michael somewhere, um, and I'll reenact some of the movements that you might see from Michael a little bit, just for your YouTube people, um, a lot of like this kind of thing all the time and making silly noises like, ee! Ee! and it's very disruptive to people. People see it and they're like, mm. and some of the faces that I encounter, Leanne, from people of disgust, like, why can't you control your child? What's the matter with you? That child is disgusting to me. That's the face that I get way too often. And I don't think there's anything in this world that makes me want to fight someone more than that, that makes me feel so angry. And then I take a step back and I realize it's ignorance. And and I don't mean ignorance in, in the sense where people are trying to be insulting. It's not knowing. It's just being unaware of autism. I still deal with people who don't know what autism is. And even those who, who know, claim to know what it is, when they see it in action, they're like, what the hell? And so that's part of why I do it. Not, not just personally, because I don't want to see that face anymore. I don't want anybody who's dealing with enough already in their lives, the child with a disability themselves and their parents, they are dealing with way, way, way more than anybody knows. So give them a break, maybe a sympathetic smile instead of this look of disgust. That goes a long way, especially with the parents, because oftentimes the child with disability, they're not going to be that, you know, they're aware. not as in tune with it. Exactly. They're not going to notice a, 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 an ugly look on someone's face, but the parent does. And uh, so from that perspective, awareness and from this perspective of, you know, the more the more we talk about it. The more we engage about it, the you know the better understanding there will be. Maybe one day with the provincial government funding this thing properly, um, I will say this: I have some level of sympathy 
in that uh, if you gave the $100,000 a year that every autistic family needs to do this funding properly, you're bankrupting the province of Ontario. That said, I understand why everybody's livid right now about the funding model that they're trying to cram through. That's... There's the the funding, there's the understanding, there's there's a lot to it. And I think you still, I, I think you have the energy still, it seems, to be able to still take this on and to still be a part of it and to s- still share in that messaging. I know uh, hopefully you'll use the podcast. I mean, I don't know if you talk about it on the Steve Warren Project. I know there's <laughs> a, a ton of stuff that's happening. I know mm-hmm. that you have it daily. So good luck with that. I, I, I get these once, twice a week, and it's like, wow, a daily. That's like a full-time <laughs> Oh, it has been it's a full-time, a full-time job time show for sure. right off the bat. So congratulations on it and that people jumped on it right away. I think people were looking when you left the show to immediately find where they were going to get their Steve Warren and get that fixed for the day. So good luck with it. People can find the Steve Warren Project where? SteveWProject.com. And okay. it's at, at that website. And we just launched it last week. It's brand new. Um, you can listen to the show directly on your laptop mm-hmm. or your desktop. There's all the apps you can find it on there. It's, it's everywhere pretty much. Uh, you can become a Patreon member there as well. So everything, if you want to advertise, everything you need is at stevewproject.com. Yeah, I'm going to look at that because then we'll start with the advertising and the patrons for everyone that's been listening to Living Your Life. I'll have to figure out exactly how that works. And adventuresinautism.ca. That's it. That, that's the website if you want to be able to head out and check out that blog and some of the YouTube uh, videos that you've done. Steve, thanks so much for joining us. It's crazy, eh, how time goes. I'm like way over the hour at this point. Uh-oh. Isn't that crazy? Uh, I was too worried. I I, no, but I used to go like, <laughs> I used to want four to five minutes and now I find an hour is going way too fast. I do appreciate your time and I just want to let people know as well, living your life with Leanne Lang, if you can go like, subscribe, share, uh, let people know the topics, the people, always very interesting uh, and allow this podcast to grow as well. Steve, really appreciate your time today. It was a treat to be here and it's great to see you. You too.